Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp, RMO on the TSX Venture Exchange. Rainy Mountain's Brunswick property is located in the Ridout Shear Zone in Ontario, with grab samples running as high as 32 grams per tonne gold. A follow-up drill program to test numerous targets located by recent groundwork is planned for early 2018. Please visit our website at rmroyalty.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is market historian Bob Hoy. He's the chief investment strategist for InstitutionalAdvisors.com. Welcome back to the show, Bob. Yeah, hi, Jim. It's uh, fascinating uh, markets we have. Any panic phone calls or emails come onto your desk this week? <laughs> no, fortunately, we we don't get those. the The idea of of um, doing research is to minimize the opportunity for surprises. And with our work, we focus on trying to find when the market is going to change, either up or down, and. Um, on this one, who <laughs> really pleased because if we go back to early October, our October 4th uh, pivot outlined that even the Dow Jones could bubble, like everything was going to bubble, and it did. So then the next day, or part of that statement was that every bubble runs to a climax and then contraction. And then trying to find out when that would occur, like the climax, we looked back on a number of speculations uh, that did do what we call the turn of the year peak, like in December or January. And, of course, one of the great sensational ones was the speculation in gold and silver that concluded on, I think it was January 20th of 1980, and then you had the fabulous speculation in the Tokyo market with the Nikkei index making its high on the last trading year, trading day of 1989. And then a one that was not as dramatic but important was the high in the U.S. stock market on January the 11th of 1973. Uh, beyond being a turn of the year peak, uh, there was something important there because on January 30th of that year is when the news came out that, uh, five of the Watergate burglars were, uh, charged with criminal activities. And that was the start of the Nixon Watergate scandal. He, he was not involved in that burglary. It was just a break-in. But then things got out of hand and the media never liked Nixon. And he was underneath it, a conservative, so they got rid of him. So this time you have uh, not a burglary, but the scandal is that senior people in the U.S. Department of Justice and in the FBI were influencing the U.S. election, uh, trying to get Hillary to win. And then, shock of all shocks, when she did not, then the effort since then has been to depose a sitting president, duly elected. Now, in parliamentary systems uh, like in England going back you could have the party uh, remove the leader as they did with Mrs. Thatcher but that's not the government removing a leader that's, that's politics so here you have and at the same time the Democrats have been going on and on that the only way Hillary could lose was because the Russian government influenced 
the U.S. electoral process. And they continue to push that. But at the same time, Democrats or their operatives at the Department of Justice or FBI, you had the U.S. government trying to influence and actually, you know, and now the evidence is coming out. There's no question that this, in which case, this is a constitutional problem of immense proportions. So it'll go on for a long time. And that was the case in the 1973-74 bear market in New York. It went on and crashed down into October, which is a, a usually a very good time to end a crash. And then it bounced up, and then it went down, and it was just ugly uh, into testing the low in December. And then you set up a new bull market. So the probability of a bear market following the kind of speculation we've had is quite high. The trick is when. <laughs> so <laughs> the um, the target of December January worked, certainly worked for the Bitcoin bubble, and we should just go back on December nineteenth is when we got a sequential sell uh, on the Bitcoin, and that is uh, based upon pattern. So it was the first such signal in two years on the Bitcoin, so the conclusion was then, you know, instantaneously was that it should be the biggest correction in two years, and then it's turned out to be a very serious drop, and it's taken out levels where one might think you'd find support. So at the moment, this market is seeking a bottom, but we're not putting a level or a, a timing on this, but for some sunshine, uh, oftentimes the uh, you can have uh, credit spread narrowing, like April, May, or June, and that would help on the rebound. But the and never anyway you look at it, it's a very hard hit to the markets. And I, Jim, I picked up one just this morning where yesterday Dudley, the guy at the Fed. Uh, he's written up as says, saying that the market drop is, quote, small potatoes, end quote. Man, he said that the economy is still strong. So there's a, a danger in this one because in ordinary business cycle con conditions, if you have a speculative high in the stock market, uh, often, and it was traditional that some 10 to 12 months later, you'd have a peak in the economy. So the stock market would lead the economy by 10 to 12 months. As a matter of fact, it's so reliable that uh, it's included in the official list of leading indicators. So then it's even on orthodox concepts, it's inappropriate to say that there's no problem in the stock market because the economy's strong. But then, Jim, in the world of financial asset inflation, which we've been in for decades, it's different. When you get a speculative, a really big speculative peak in the stock market, it occurs very close to the economy failing. And the last big peak in the stock market was... Uh, 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 October of two, uh, 2007, and the recession started in December, close enough. The previous great bubble concluded in 1929, and the uh, high for the stock market was September, and the peak in the economy was August, and then you go back at the earliest records there are, where there's official designation of the business cycle, was the bubble of 1873, which in New York peaked in uh, September, <laughs> Jim, September is often a fateful month, and the uh, recession started that October. So, in a new world, in a new era, this is what happens. So, the break in the stock market here is very important, and it will find some relief 
and then we will find out whether the stock market goes to on on a relief rally, whether it goes to two uh, to new highs, or whether like in 2000 with the dot com bubble, where uh, the high was in March, very hard hit, and then a recovery out to September, and the S and P almost made it to the new highs, but the Nasdaq didn't. So we're living in very exciting times. We'll have more with Bob Hoy right after the break. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the pink symbol ABN AF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc., listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome back. We're talking with Bob Hoy. Bob, usually the transports give us some warning that we're going to see a correction. Did that happen this time? Yeah, Jim, that's the the Dow theory. Uh, It worked for us in 2015 on that uh, important decline. But uh, And, of course, we'll watch it. Uh, And, no, uh, the high in the transports uh, was close to the high in the Dow. Uh, So it, it, it did not give any lead at all but it, it it's the transports have been selling off uh, and that theory oh gosh it's been around since the early 1900s and uh, it uh, it's not a precise gauge but it is uh, an imp- it can be an important one so we sort of keep track of it actually in 2015 was the first time we ever used it and there was a long uh, di- uh, divergence there where the Dow had made went on to making new highs in in 2015, and not making new highs was the transport. So that gave a long warning, but not this time. Uh, what we were looking at uh, only just a few weeks ago was that with the degree of speculation, uh, there would be a reversal in the credit markets, uh, i.e. the uh, Credit spreads and the and the yield curve, and we weren't sure that when this the curve and spreads reversed, how would it relate to the stock market? So then, what I wrote was that it could be like in two thousand and seven, where the credit markets reversed in June, and by August it seriously reversed. And then the high was in October. Or it could be like in the blow off in March 2000 with the dot, dot com phenomenon where effectively in February and March the, uh, the credit spreads turned as the speculation failed. Well, this is the case now. Uh, bang, all of a sudden. So say, uh, a week and a half ago, the uh, curve had changed a little, and spreads had widened a little, but you couldn't call it a trend change. It just it happened. So, yeah, it's it's so it's virtually simultaneous, as with the ha- the the conclusion of the speculation in February March of two thousand. So, uh, yeah, it, it all plays a role. Now the other part that was positive for the stock market was when we go back to November when uh, you were getting a seasonal low and that we were looking for the uh, industrial commodities, base metals oh, plus crude plus the uh, lumber to be positive out to around March. And uh, yeah, they were. 
until a few weeks ago. And we're just looking at the, the chart here on the oil stocks. Uh, the ETF is XLE. And it took six months to get to a very nice peak uh, two weeks ago. And it's taken two weeks and a few days to give up most of the rally. Now this, but that's often the case with speculative markets. They, they go up, uh, at a certain pace, and when they come down, it's faster, depending on the degree of speculation. So, as a matter of fact, at the moment, the uh, oil stocks are getting over, oversold. So somewhere in here, within a week, they should base and and set themselves up for another rally. Uh, so, uh, but Jim, you want, we want to look at, at the big picture where in previous speculative markets, like in 2007, one, it had sold off a bit and the markets were nervous and credit markets were changing. And then, uh, Harvard economist, uh, Greg Manku is his name, was defensive of the economy. And he said that nothing could go wrong. And the exact terms he used was that because the Fed had, quote, a dream team, end quote, of economists. So they had the best team of economists imaginable at the Fed. And for people in believe of that sort of thing, nothing could go wrong. Boom, down it went. And then, in um, even th- this kind of statement comes out even in the 1873 bubble, as credit conditions were tightening and getting nervous, the uh, New York newspaper, the Herald, editorialized that nothing can go wrong, and their reason was because the U.S did not have a central bank. It did not have the Federal Reserve System. It had what they called the Treasury System. And uh, they uh, it really admired the then Secretary of the Treasury. And with this ability to ease credit, uh, the, the editorial was that nothing could go wrong because they did not have a central bank. And then in the 1929 bubble, uh, senior opinion uh, editorialized that nothing can go wrong. And the reason was because they had a new and modern Federal Reserve system <laughs> and they no longer had the dreadful uh, uh, Treasury system. So what happens is that the orthodox side of the street at a great bubble will editorialize that whatever the agency exists now has the powers to prevent bad things from happening. So uh, here we are. Uh, Bad things are happening. We'll have more with Bob Hoy right after this. Arctic Star Exploration, operated by a team of proven mine finders, is focused on diamonds in Finland and the Northwest Territories of Canada. A work program is planned for our Finland property that contains diamond-bearing kimberlite. Arctic Star trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ADD, and the Frankfurt Exchange, symbol 82A1. Please visit our website at arcticstar.ca or call us at 604-689-1799. Keep informed. Receive our weekly recap of thought-provoking articles, podcasts, and radio delivered to your inbox for free. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage, HowStreet.com. Welcome back for speaking with Bob Hoy. Bob, who buys stocks when the market is plunging like this? You have to sell to somebody who buys it. Yeah, well, in New York, they used to have specialists that were supposed to be providing liquidity on the market. So they would be on the offering side when there was strong buying, and they would be on the bid side when there's strong selling. And But then the problem on that one was that when you went into a, a liquidity crisis, they were not there to assist. Then uh, you also have had over the decades uh, something in the U.S. called the Plunge Protection Team, which is a fund of money. I can't remember how much it is, but it will intervene in the market, usually through the S&P, 
And I'm not so sure that that's a wise thing. Uh, but then you also have uh, short sellers who have shorted at high prices and who then on on a decline will be covering. So, But then the problem is that if you short too early while it's still rising and you're offside, then you've got to cover. So uh, short selling provides extra bids on the way up. But essentially... On the way down, uh, you you have shorts that will cover, and in which case, the shorting is p- helping with the liquidity in the market. And this, of course, is why you have a market of publicly traded stocks or other items such as commodities, and that is to provide liquidity. But when you get a hit uh, such as recent, uh, the liquidity disappears. So uh, now... The bad thing is that it forces government agencies to then think they have to rescue things. Like in the 2007 crash, they were buying bonds like crazy, providing liquidity, and because they really think that when a panic gets going, it'll never end. Well, all panics end on their own when the last guy sold out and the market clears. So the uh, that's a lot of nonsense. You just have to let a panic run, and eventually the last guy offside is sold out, and uh, then it, it bottoms, and uh, then they recover. But the idea of a intelligent agency such as the anything government might come up with that can it sit in there and prevent a contraction. Well, as a matter of fact, Jim, and I've mentioned this before, and back in the early 1900s, when certain people in New York felt there should be a central bank, their promotion was that with the central bank as the lender of last resort, they would prevent the financial distress that precedes a recession. So their theme was no financial distress, there'd be no recessions. Well, there's been 18 recessions since. So the concept of central banking doesn't work. So anyways, it, it'll be it'll be interesting to see how this all works out. I think the market is close to uh, clearing the immediate problems, which is essentially people offside on their leveraged margin account, and once that's cleared out, then uh, the next rally can come in. And what we're interested in is seeing is how far and how long it would run and how much dynamics you get on the upside. So, Jim, it's going to be very interesting over the next few months. Bob, thank you so much for chatting with us. Oh, always good, Jim, and look forward to next week. My guest has been market historian Bob Hoy. He's the chief investment strategist for institutionaladvisors.com. If you have any questions for Bob or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at House Street. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.